Good morning. Lots of happy people. Yes, yes, lots of happy people. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and give that in it. My name is Ann Perdue, and on behalf of the session of First Presbyterian Church in New Smyrna Beach, and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I welcome you to worship here at First Presbyterian in New Smyrna Beach. Um, if you're a visitor here, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, and uh, we hope that through this service, you feel the love and power of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit and the love of this congregation and the care that we have for one another and that you find something special in this service that you will take with you for each of us finds something every week that carries us until we're back together again. Many of you received an email from me last night at 10 o'clock. Some of you may have seen it in the night. Some of you may have seen it early in the morning. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen the email or who weren't talking with someone, um, I want you to know that last night, uh, Pastor George called me and said he is scheduled to receive his new heart tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> So um, for those of you who don't know, he's in the process of getting a heart transplant, and he will get it tonight um, and 6 o'clock. So anyone who would like is welcome to come into this sanctuary at 530, and we will begin a time of prayer. We are not going to be here praying through the whole surgery because it will not end until 2 or 3 in the morning. It is about an 8-hour surgery. It may even be longer, depending on what they find, but we will gather at 5.30 as he's headed in and as, as everything is getting started. So if you are, if you want, if you choose, please come and join us in the sanctuary um, for a time of, of prayer. Um, we are having fellowship today uh, in, in Eubank Hall. Everyone is welcome and you're more than welcome. You're encouraged to come, gather around tables with us, share your uh, hurricane, uh, uh, Milton stories and other things and our joy of, of uh, George and so uh, come and join us. The fellowship team did not know whether we were going to have electricity or not and so they planned for us to have desserts. There won't be a, a meal but there'll be desserts and a gathering around table so that we can share with one another. So come and share sweets and stories. Um, please sign the friendship pad. Let us know that you're here and then pass it down to your pew so you can know who is worshiping with you. Um, also, there are prayer cards in the pews. If you have a special prayer request or a special praise, please write it on the card and put it in the offering plate and they'll give it to me and then we will uh, uh, announce your, your prayers so that everyone can be praying for whatever your prayer request is. Well, we do know that it was quite a week for all of us. We all have some kind of story, whether you stayed here, whether you evacuated, whatever you did. Um, and some of you received the email from me letting you know that the church was in good shape and that we were going to gather for worship, thanks be to God. And um, we had no physical damage to the church. True blessing. True blessing. Um, but I know I'm going to let Frank Ibbotson, the chair of our... Frank? Yes. I, 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 I'm on it, Frank. Yeah. Are oh, you going to talk from there? Yeah. Frank is going to tell you just a little bit about the property and what has happened. Whatever you're going to say, Frank, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Ann. <laughs> You'll be seeing some pictures up here. We had uh, quite a bit of damage. Uh, one large cedar tree, which has already been claimed by someone, so if you want a cedar tree, you'll have to negotiate with their neighbor across the alley. But um, let me first say, the crew, our Newman's crew, who are here every Thursday morning at 8, eight o'clock, we have a little fellowship and then we work. We clean the campus, clean the parking lot, do the lawn out there, and you were able to get in the parking lot you would not have been able to get in the parking lot if it wasn't for this crew. Um, 
it, the whole crew couldn't be there because some of them had to be home taking care of their places, but would the crew that came on Friday and worked to get that lot and the trees and the stuff off the campus, would you please stand? <laughs> Believe me, they worked, they worked hard. Now, we also have the whole crew, and I just, I know I'm getting a little lengthy here, but would the whole crew stand up so you know who those other people are as well that are here every Thursday working? <laughs> now, we have a few of the crew, Barbara in the back and Chuck, they're working uh, security today, so you don't see them. They're, they're back by the entrance. But anyway, these are the people that put their heart and soul in there. And one of our people that uh, works with the crew but is not here at church is Andy. He's a, he's a faithful servant of ours and works with us. We got everything cleared up. You can see there's a fence broken down where one of the trees went, and uh, I think that's enough, Ann. <laughs> so uh, you can see from the pictures, I can't even see the pictures from here, but also like the, uh, for announcements, the okay. men's breakfast. I'm going to do that. You got the men's breakfast? Men's breakfast. Got it. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> also, during the hurricane, um, 11 people sheltered here at the church in Eubank Hall uh, from Wednesday morning and through Thursday afternoon. I was one of them, and we did feel safe in that solid concrete block room. Um, and I wanted to thank the hurricane pre preparation team, who's worked all summer uh, to help both the church building and our congregation be ready for the, quote, just in case time. And our just in case time came. And so we were, we were ready. Uh, as, as ready as we, as we knew to be. So I want to th uh, thank that team of people, um, Milton Fulton, Floris Rogers, Lori Grizzard, Frank Ibbotson, Lee Chegwin, uh, Barbara Stoles, Ellie Osterhaus, and myself. And we worked hard to get the church building and the congregation ready. Um, I also want to thank Lori Grizzard for, uh, she and I worked to get everything ready for the Eubank Hall, for Wednesday and Thursday, we drove to Daytona and got wonderful cots and bedding so that people had comfortable places and didn't have to try to sleep in a chair. And uh, so we, uh, and I want to thank Frank and, the, and uh, the churches for the generator and for teaching both me and Lori how to run a generator without blowing anything up. So <laughs> that was good. That was good. Um, I want to thank Norma Carter for the brownies. It was so nice to have a, a brownie on, 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 uh, on Wednesday afternoon. And for Doreen Cole for helping us uh, get ready for everything. And I want to thank everyone who sheltered with us because you made it feel like community in the midst of a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, we played magnets and trained dominoes in phase 10. We had conversation. We ate too much and we slept too little. And we had three dogs and three cats. So <laughs> it, it was all very family-like, and it was wonderful. So in the past few weeks, um, I have read to you a message from uh, George after I finished the announcements. Um, and today, I want to read it now uh, for you. This is one that he sent to me last night about quarter to nine, something like that so that I could print it out and read it to you. And then at 9.30, he called me to tell me that it had changed. But I'm gonna read it anyway, just because I think you need to hear how his day was and what he wanted you to hear when he did not know he was gonna get a heart. Greeting, greetings, everyone. What a week. I'm so proud of our church and the response of our leaders to the hurricane situation. I'm sure you will hear details from our own Jim Cantori, weather guru and Purdue, concerning the great time that they had sheltering. It's serious business and can save lives, but how did they make it seem like so much fun? The hospital was locked down while the storm passed, so no one was admitted in or out of the facility. The medical staff treated it like an unavoidable slumber party. 
They were sleeping in shifts on air mattresses, and they did it with the same good humor our church has in facing difficult things. I spent the time in prayer for you and all the folks of our community. Mayo Hospital is the only Category 5 hardened building in Jacksonville, so I knew I was safe. As for me, I'm still hooked up to Ludwig von Pumptoven. Remember, that's what he named his pump that's been keeping his heart going. Ludwig von Pumptoven. Of course, and they're always tweaking my medications. We're all waiting in a holding pattern. Yesterday, I walked 30 laps of the hospital hallway. It's a personal record. And they say the more I walk, the faster I will recover. If only they would bring me a bike. <laughs> I appreciate the prayers of support and the visits. Today, Rose and the grandchildren came to spend most of the day, and we ordered hospital food for everyone. Please don't report us for abuse. <laughs> I've had several opportunities to share my faith story with other patients and encourage them as best I can. God is good, and I feel I'm in the right place at the right time with the right healers. In short, I feel I am in the palm of God's hand every day. Remember how much I love you and how much I miss you. Pastor George. Um, and then to finish up uh, most of the, the, the announcements, everything in the church that's on your um, newsletter calendar is starting up again. The Bible studies, the meetings, the gatherings, so look at, your, look at your October newsletter, and anything that you see on there is going to be uh, happening this week. Uh, Hurricane Milton slowed us down, but we're back up, and we are going today. Uh, so our last announcement is uh, that our, mission, our minute for mission today is Operation Christmas Child. And so Becky's going to come and tell us about Operation Christmas Child. Amen. Where do I begin? I've found all those wonderful, wonderful announcements. And uh, let's just take a moment and praise God for, for the joy that we're all here. And we have a new challenge. It's Christmas. But, oh, there she is. I was wondering where she was. <laughs> She's back. <laughs> John, would you do the video? Okay, I'm sorry we don't have sound, so just pretend you can hear all these children yelling and screaming for joy. And by the way, we all have such a good time, don't we, putting the boxes together? We do. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, girls, the 28th, if, if you want to help pack a box, join us on the 28th. Because for those of you who don't like to buy, you can always donate, and we buy the things for you, and then we have a big packing party. So you can join us on the 28th for a packing party. In your bulletin today, um, there's, it's a two-sided, and there is a mistake. Uh, I'm, I really <laughs> love typing anymore. <laughs> it tells you to look in the bulletin for a list of things you can buy and not buy. It's look in your box. When you get a box, there's one of these in there, and it gives you hints about things to buy. But more important, it tells you what not to buy. Because these boxes go through a warehouse and every solitary box is opened to make sure that there's nothing in it that should go. So it just makes it a heck of a lot easier um, if, if that box doesn't have anything in it that should be pulled. So we talked about there's two ways this year. You can buy and, and get a box. We have them here and we're going to have them over in the uh, hallway. Um, and you can build, you do 
your normal thing. If you don't like to shop or you don't feel like shopping, then uh, next week there'll be a donation box back there. We would recommend $25, but you may give as little or more as you want to help us fill um, the boxes. Also, within your bulletin on the other side of this is a short information about Samaritan's Purse, who we do this through, and I thought maybe you'd like to know a little bit about them. They're quite an organization, and last year, between all the countries that gave shoeboxes, 11 point million shoeboxes went out to the children all around the world. So uh, with everything that they're doing right now through the hurricane, these shoe boxes will still be filled and, and gone. So we hope you'll grab your shoe box today, if not next week, and have fun. Think of the joy of doing it. And while we're doing it, praise God that we are able to do it. Thank you. They, they made them. And 35 of them came from Sharon Ashram up in Michigan. For those of you on the video who couldn't hear all of that, uh, the sewing group has donated 100 pair of shorts to go into the boxes. And so next week we'll have the shorts over here for you to pick up to put in the, in the boxes. Uh, so uh, they, they've, these are handmade shorts that, that they have made, uh, not only the ones that are here every Wednesday sewing, but also uh, Sharon Arstrom has made some uh, from up in Michigan and sent them to us. So we're grateful for, for that. Um, I have two quick announcements for tomorrow. One is that the men's breakfast meets at 9 o'clock at the, uh, the Little Griddle on Canal Street, and all men are invited. And Presbyterian women will meet tomorrow at 9.30 in the chapel for Bible study, 10 o'clock for fellowship, and 10.30 uh, for our Hearts of Hope. The guest speaker will be from Beacon House, the domestic abuse shelter that serves families in Volusia County, and all women are invited to that. So we have all men at the Little Griddle for breakfast and all women here at the church. So everybody can be here tomorrow morning. That's what I, that's what I think. Now, I want to introduce to you our guest pastor for today. She's waited very patiently through <laughs> 20 minutes of announcements. We are a one active church who are not sitting still. Um, so I want to introduce to you Jean Meredith. And Jean um, is a commissioned lay pastor here in Central Florida Presbytery. Uh, she's done that for about 10 years. And her husband, Gary, has joined her here for worship. And we're glad to have you with us as well, Gary. Thanks. Um, and as her, as her, in her position as commissioned lay pastor, she served as a liaison to the Committee on Ministry for our pastor nominating committee called George seven years ago. So we're so glad to have Jean back and she knows some of you. So. Uh, she is continuing to serve several churches who are without pastors uh, on a regular basis. And before she was a pastor, she taught school in Volusia County for 30 years. So was a school teacher. Uh, like, like many of us. Um, on a personal note, uh, Jean and Gary uh, have two amazing grandchildren, I'm sure more amazing than all of us. Uh, each one of us could say that. They live in Melbourne and they spend a lot of time with them. They also enjoy uh, going to the mountains for hiking and skiing and so we're glad that you are not in the mountains right now and that you are here with us and we are so grateful that you're going to lead us in worship. So now, honest, that's it. So let's set our hearts and our minds this time of the worship of Almighty God.
even after a mighty storm, what a blessing it is to be able to join together in worship. Join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Who is likened unto you, O God? With whom can you be compared? You are seated on high and look far down upon the heavens and the earth. You raise the poor from the earth, and the needy you lift from the heap of ashes. Let us worship God. together and confess what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
song as we celebrate the good news of Reverend Head today. It just really does just fill our hearts. Let's pray. Gracious God, as there's still a lot of debris in our minds and our hearts as we exit this storm and think about what's next, help us right now just to settle in, to take a deep breath and be at peace as we receive your word. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Amen. Our scripture today is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Jesus has been teaching and preaching and healing and just being with all kinds of people. And now the scripture tells us he is setting out on a journey. And that journey will be taking him to Jerusalem, where he will be facing the greatest sacrifice ever for us. So before he sets out on that journey... He has one more really hard lesson to teach. So let us hear these words from Mark chapter 10. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news 
who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of our Lord. So today's scripture is asking difficult questions. We ask a lot of questions in our lives, some easy like, honey, have you seen my glasses? Yeah. And some hard, why? Why did this happen to me? Some of those hard questions we ask are challenging because we know the answer to the question will require something of us. For instance, if I ask, what can I do to help? What can I do to earn your forgiveness? What do I need to do to be stronger during such challenging times? Or how do I earn my place in heaven? All of those questions may be, have some demanding answers. In our passage today, the man asked a really difficult, deep question, a question that he may not have been prepared to receive such a challenging answer to an answer that included the hard truth that much sacrifice would be required of him. He may have been hoping for a nice little neat and attainable answer, something like, hey, if you want eternal life, you just need to pray every day or attend a Bible study class, memorize scripture, or give to a good charity. But he received an answer that changed his life because Jesus was not going to give him an easy out answer. Jesus' answer was straightforward and had a sense of immediacy to it. I love the Gospel of Mark because, it, because it's the shortest gospel, no, but, but because it has this sense of immediacy throughout it. In fact, the word immediately comes 40 times, and I like something that just keeps moving and really builds up that sense of this is immediate. Over and over again, we sense the important work that Jesus was doing for the sake of God's kingdom. But this isn't just about what Jesus was doing, because Mark is this relentless gospel which not only invites us into believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, but this gospel also works to prove again and again the impossibility of faith. It doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? The impossibility of faith, but let's stay with the story. In an impossible world that we live in right now, it's hard to hear words that tell us how hard and demanding it is to truly be a follower of Christ. Jesus' response to this faithful man shows us just how hard it is to respond to Jesus when he says, follow me. I think this is one of the most challenging scriptures in the gospel. It's one that makes us squirm and say, hey, let's go to another chapter and find something a little easier to do. I mean, I think most of us could probably check off our list today, thou shall not murder. I don't know, during the storm, (laughs) I was a little testy, but I can still check that off. (laughs) But for many of us, what Jesus is asking in this scripture is actually more demanding. As we begin to look at the story, I wanna look more at the man that was involved. Mark doesn't give us a whole lot to work with here. We know that this anonymous man reveres Jesus as a teacher. He seems to be wealthy and a pious observer of the law. Other than that, we really don't know much about his life story. I think it would If we knew more about him, it might be easier to say, well, I am nothing like that man, so this lesson that Jesus is teaching doesn't relate to me. For instance, if this man was a millionaire and very greedy, or if he treated others as subordinates, or if he had a really mean streak, we might find comfort by saying, he is nothing like me. So this story is not a lesson I need. By distancing ourselves from this man, we might be able to put more space between us and the truth that Jesus speaks. 
But let's look at what we do know. This man wanted to be a true and dedicated follower of Jesus. And that's certainly something we can connect with. We also can, can detect that this man had a boldness as he lived out his faith. The fact that he ran up to Jesus, knelt in front of him, and then asked him a difficult question. This man has courage and passion, something that we strive to have in our journey, in our faith journey. We also know that this man was very devout. He kept the law, he had been loyal to God, and he wanted to know what else he could do as a follower. And once again, as Christians, that is something that we can relate to. This devout follower finds himself in front of Jesus, and he's in this humble posture, ready and listening. His sincere question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's not a test for Jesus like the Pharisees like to throw out. He truly wants to know. But does he really want to know? I mean, maybe all he wanted or needed was some assurance, a word of praise for being a good, decent, law-abiding person. Maybe a word of encouragement to keep up the good work. Maybe he just hoped to hear Jesus say, that God would be so proud of him. To hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. But Jesus gave him a much more demanding answer to this difficult question. First, Jesus lists the commandments that we are called to live by, and this man confidently claims that he had observed them since his youth. Then something happens, and this is my favorite part of the exchange. Scripture says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said. Jesus knew this man, his goodness and his shortcomings. And what did Jesus do? He looked at him and he loved him. Jesus looked at him and he sees him as his beloved. Interestingly, this man is the only person in the entire Gospel of Mark that is singled out as being loved by Jesus. Now we know that Jesus loved others and Jesus loves us. The truth is God truly knows each of us and he still loves us completely and he still claims us as his beloved. So if we were in conversation like this with Jesus, we have to know that he would look at us with love also but he would also, we would also have to accept that his answer to this difficult question would be as challenging today as it was long ago. Jesus answered, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus lovingly looked him in the eyes and shared with him words that caused not only this man, but all who were listening to be shocked. So we could just stop here and say the lesson to the story is don't ask difficult questions if you aren't ready for the challenging answers. Like, don't ask, does this robe make me look skinny? Because <laughs> the answer might not be what I want to hear, right? But in this story, the answer was asked. And it's important to notice when the question, was, the, the question was asked and where we fall in this timeline of Mark's gospel. At this point in the story, Jesus already had his eyes and his life and his heart and his mission set towards Jerusalem. He knew his time was limited here on earth, and he had still felt he had so much to accomplish he was working so hard to shape the disciples and all the followers into becoming lifelong followers and leaders. He was trying hard to help the crowds to understand God's message that was brought to life through him. Time was running out for Jesus here on earth, and Jesus needed his followers to be fully committed. But after this faithful man received Jesus' sincere and demanding response, 
the scripture says, he left hastily and weighed down with heavy grief. This is the last we hear of this man. We don't know his full story. And so we wonder, was it just the money he didn't want to give up? Or perhaps some precious possession? Or was it status and power? Or did he have issues taking part in economic justice and sharing his money with the poor? We don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus' demand on this man's life was not just for him, was it? It wasn't just for those that were gathered around Jesus that day. This message and the difficult answer is for all of us. It's a question that we probably all wrestle with, one that we certainly do better with on some days. A question that makes me wonder if I would be just like this man. Could I accept the difficult challenge to surrender all of me for the sake of the kingdom? Or would I walk away shocked and grieved? The rest of these verses help us understand how difficult this man was because Jesus goes on and he speaks to the disciples who he addresses as children because they are still learning and expands the challenge that he was trying to convey. And when he does, the scripture says the disciples were perplexed and astounded by Jesus' proclamation that it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Once again, this is about Jesus challenging the social order and turning it upside down. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And this is all very difficult. It was then, it is today. But Jesus made it very clear throughout his teachings that wealth can get in the way of his, our walk with Jesus. He does not say that wealth is bad, but it can get in the way of loving God and loving others. Here's the good news to the story. As hard as it is to think that we must give away all that is a barrier to living out the great commandment to love God and love others, Jesus gives us hope in this lesson. When the disciples asked Jesus, well, then who the heck can be saved if what you're saying is true? Jesus replied, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Word of caution, that doesn't mean all things are easy because of God. It doesn't mean that all things will be happy and blessed because of God. This means that if we choose to journey this challenging path, God is with us, guiding us and empowering us. If life is hard and doesn't turn out the way we hoped, God is with us, guiding us and giving us hope. For God, all things are possible, including claiming each of us as his beloved including forgiving us when we stumble on our journey to follow him. Truth is, we know we are to live our lives out thanks to God's word. And the truth is that we will fall short in many ways, including the truth that at sometimes we will allow possessions and power and selfishness and laziness to get in the way of loving God and loving others as we are to love ourselves which takes me back to one of the favorite parts. Remember, I told you that he's the only one in the Gospel of Mark that Scripture says Jesus, where Jesus said he loves someone. Well, there's more. This man is also the only person in the whole Gospel of Mark who walks away from the invitation to follow Jesus. This good, good man walks away from following Jesus at least at this point in his life. Yes, the man was shocked and left grieving, but we don't know what happened after that. 
I just can't imagine that this man threw in the towel. I mean, he was so devoted to God. My hope is that there was someone in this man's life that listened, loved, and nurtured him. I want to believe that an elder, a mentor, a friend, a priest, a struggling Christian spoke words of truth into him. And over time, he continued his journey as a follower of Jesus. I believe that because I see it over and over again in church. Church members and leaders speaking truth into us and lovingly helping us as we stumble along the journey. For there is not one of us who gets it right all the time. And some of us stumble a lot more than others. And that is why we need church community. Scripture is telling us that discipleship thing is pretty much impossible. At least if we try to do it on our own, we need God and we need community. Jesus calls us over and over again to follow him. And it is a difficult thing to do, but it's a beautiful thing to do. Because when we follow Jesus and strive to love God and love others, then we are furthering God's kingdom here on earth. When we support each other, when we remind each other that we are all God's beloved on the good days and on the bad days, when we see the good in each other and name it, when we take on a servant heart, when we love like Jesus, then we are furthering God's kingdom. This difficult story is a story of Christ's love for us and his commandment to love God fully and love others. And we know how hard that can be. But it's also a reminder of God's love and his abundant grace. So as we stumble along this faith journey, may we, re we remember that God is with us, loving us, and guiding us. Gracious God, we give thanks once again that the journey may be hard, but you are with us, and that we will stumble because it is difficult but you are with us. We give thanks for the reminder that through you, all things are possible. And we give thanks for your grace as we stumble, as we forget, as we give up. Gracious God, we give so much thanks for your love and for the church community who continues to hold each other up. Lord God, we give you thanks today for so many things. And we lift praises to you. In son, your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are truly blessed. God has given us so much. And this is our opportunity to give back so the church can continue to further God's kingdom right here in this community and throughout the world.
I just wanted to make one remark. Um, Ann Perdue knew that she's going to have a lot of announcements today, so she said for me to make it short. <coughs> Love was when God became a man. Locked in time and space Without rank or place Love was God Born of Jewish kin Just a carpenter with some fishermen. God was when Jesus walked in history. Lovingly he brought a new life that's free. Love was God nailed to bleed and die to reach and love one such as I. <clears throat> love was when God became a man down where I could see love that reached to me. Love was God dying for my sin and so trapped was I my whole world caved in. Love was when Jesus rose to walk with me. Lovingly he brought a new life that's free. Love was God, only He would try to reach and love one such as I, to love one such as I. Thank you, Bill. The message is perfect, perfect. We do have some prayer requests today, and um, the first one is a reminder to everyone that um, the memorial service for Becky Ralph Whittle will be on Thursday morning, the 17th, here in the sanctuary at 10 o'clock, and everyone is invited. It'll be followed by a reception. And last Sunday, I shared with you uh, that Dick Hill had died on Saturday, and uh, his service will be here in the sanctuary on Monday, the 21st of uh, October. Uh, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow uh, at 11 o'clock, a little bit later than Becky's. It'll be at 11 o'clock, again, followed by a reception. And so this week, as we're praying, we pray for both of these families as they are in uh, in grief and preparation for these services for, for their loved ones and for the two people that we love so very much here in this congregation. We have a prayer request, of course, for all of those affected by Hurricane Milton, the people individually, the families, the churches, and the communities. And I wanted to say that uh, Westminster-by-the-Sea uh, had some damage to their church 
uh, up in uh, Daytona Beach Shores, and they weren't able to worship today. And so we're grateful that Janet uh, Foley, who was here with us a couple of weeks ago, and her husband, Reverend Mike Foley, who's the interim there, came here uh, to worship. So we pray for uh, that community of faith, uh, for the individuals who uh, are, are struggling not only with their own homes and families, but with their, with their church, uh, the, the building itself. And so we pray for you and all of those uh, up there. Um, we also pray for Hyde Park Presbyterian Church in Tampa. It sustained damage from Hurricane Milton, and uh, the church and the members were still recovering from Helene and now they have more damage uh, in a Hyde Park Presbyterian Church in Tampa. So we add them uh, to our prayers. Um, we want to give uh, thanks and praise that Ron Church is here today. He had surgery on Tuesday and he's walking and continuing to recover, but we're grateful that Ron could be here today following his surgery. And uh, Gail Luttrell, our office manager, is still waiting for the results from her procedure, but her surgery has been scheduled. And it'll be at 10 o'clock on October the 28th, two weeks from tomorrow, uh, 10 in the morning here in Advent in New Smyrna Beach. So she'll be out for most of that next week. But we continue to pray for, for Gail as she prepares for, for, that, for that surgery. And then um, our, our last uh, prayer request today is for the family of the organ do donor who is giving an organ and who today is in grief. Uh, as, as they miss this, the person who they were so wonderful to give organs to so that our Pastor George can live a long and uh, active life. And so we pray for that, for that family, uh, for the wonderful sacrifice that they've made for not only George, but for us and all who know and love him. So we'll go to prayer. I invite you just to, as we come into prayer, to just kind of settle your feet and maybe take a couple of deep breaths, breathing in God's peace and breathing out anxiety. God of blue skies and God of storms, we are here today humbled and thankful that we can turn to you in the midst of any situation. It's been a tough few days and weeks, Lord. We pray for those who've experienced trauma from Hurricanes Helene and Milton, from North Carolina through Florida. Trauma that was physical, emotional, financial, the list goes on. We pray for them a sense of peace and comfort, even in the midst of chaos, and for community. We pray that they know that they are not alone as they walk through these challenges. Lord God, we give thanks for the many workers, the volunteers, and those that are giving up their lives to, to help restore, feed, get supplies to those stranded, those working to get back power and water. We give thanks for the sacrifices that they are making. Give them strength and energy and help them to know of the great appreciation for all that they are doing. And Lord, each and every day, help us to search for ways to be a helper. Whether it is just to give hugs and a sense of community to others that are mourning, or to actually move branches or dig mud out or whatever it takes, Lord, help us to be willing to be generous with our time, our efforts, and our money so that all of these people can find a normalcy again. And gracious God, we pray for those who mourn right here in this church community and throughout our country. So many lives have been lost because of the hurricanes. 
Help them to find your peace. Gracious God, we give thanks for Pastor George and all that is ahead for him. We pray that from the moment the surgery starts that you are able to guide the hands that are there with him and that his life can be restored in ways that he can't even imagine now. We pray for Deborah and the entire family as they are filled, I am sure, with great anxiety. And yes, Lord, we pray for the one who is no longer here on earth, but is willing to give up organs so that others can live. We pray for that family as they mourn the loss. Help them to know that this sacrifice is helping others. Lord God, there are so many other prayer needs. Help us today in the midst of continuing to clean up and find a, just a balance in our lives to continue to talk to you, to pray that you will give us the strength to be the community and the follower that you desire. We offer all these prayers in your precious son's name who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus calls each of us to follow him. And when he does that, he looks at each of us with love and he stays in fo- with us, guiding us. So as you go today, go knowing that you have the love of God, the abundant grace of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And go knowing that each of you are a beloved child of God. Hallelujah. Amen.